Hi everyone, welcome to class. This is Art 105, Art Appreciation. I'm Jeffrey Glossop and I'll be your professor for class. Um, welcome to class, welcome to my studio. This class is all about getting you to understand the visual world and art in particular. Um, I'm not an art historian, I'm an abstract painter. So the idea is that I'm sort of an ambassador for you into the art world. Um, I've just got a few introductory slides I want to show you, so we will do that now. Okay, so again, this is a part art appreciation. Um, my Instagram is jglossop. You can see what I'm working on currently there. I update about once or twice a week, so I'm pretty active. I'm still kind of getting Instagram, so Bear with me with my posts, I suppose. That's me. That is another shot of my studio. You can see my work is quite abstract. There isn't a subject matter aside from the paint itself and the colors and the lines happening. Um, again, Instagram, jglossop. My website, jglossop.com, definitely not updated as much as Instagram. So, the big thing that we're doing is looking at the difference between content and form. And content is what you're seeing, what the message is. And form is how it's being done. So how is the message being conveyed? Obviously, the content and form of the last slide is very different from the content and form of this slide. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the elements of art and the principles of design. And I think you'll be familiar with a lot of these words. It's just we're going to use them in a very specific way to describe art. They are sort of the language of art. Line and shape and mass and space and color and texture. So these are all the basic characteristics of what you see. Think of them as describing individual Lego blocks. And the principles of design are sort of the behaviors of those blocks. So you've got value and contrast and emphasis and movement, and balance, proportion and scale, rhythm and pattern and unity and variety. And I just realized something, value is actually an element. So it should be on the last slide. Value is brightness. Um, but when we combine things like red next to blue, we get contrast. So that's how contrast is a behavior of the elements. And you can see that scale is happening in this slide of Richard Serra sculptures. You see the people are very small in scale compared to the artwork. We can describe a bunch of other things happening here like movement as well. There's a lot of movement created by the wavy lines. A lot of rhythm happening here as well. There's not pattern happening here, though. We'll describe the difference between pattern and rhythm later on. Here's a great a work with great variety happening. So this is still a cohesive work of art. This is called an installation. It's sort of like expanded sculpture. Um, you can see all of these different parts are all different varieties of shapes of things. But the whole work is unified by its message. Um, and we can break art down into several mediums, or lots of mediums actually, but the more traditional ones that we think of are drawing and painting and printmaking and sculpture and photography and architecture. We'll look at this painting quite a lot, and especially for the iconography happening here or the symbolism happening here. And we would actually have to know a lot about the culture or context of this painting to pick up on everything. For example, the, the shoes down at the bottom of the painting represent something. The dog represents something. Even the chandelier represents something. The fruit in the window represents something. So all of these things have very specific meanings that someone that is in the culture at the time this was made would understand readily. So the content would be very apparent for those people. 
This is also supposedly the very first oil painting. Content and form very different here, but there is some sort of symbolism happening here. This is a cave painting from Lascaux, France. Um, we can see there's this large bull being depicted. We don't actually know why the bull was being depicted, why somebody took the time to paint this on a cave wall. I mean, were they just bored? Or was it to bring a good hunt? Or was there some religious aspect here? We don't really know. Same here, this is an example of cubism. This is Fernand Leger. Way different form. Um, you know, what could we decipher about content here? Well, we can easily describe the forms, um, but it's a lot more difficult to describe the content. We know it had something to do with astronomy, but not necessarily what. We don't even know who actually built this. So just like the cave painting, it's really hard to decipher what's going on here. Here's a different object by Anish Kapoor. Um, again, a little bit hard to decipher, even though we're from the same culture that this was created for. Another example where we need to know about the culture and understand this, um, you know, are there specific materials used other than for their color, the teeth and the eyes, and the overall shape of this head? We'll spend a lot of time talking about style because I really want you to be able to describe the style of works. And the big question there is, is something naturalistic or is it abstract? And what's the difference between realistic and idealistic? The word realistic is used wrongly very often. It has a very specific meaning. And idealistic is a lot more appropriate for a lot of the images we see nowadays. So this painting is an example of romanticism. And that word is another word that's used a lot, but we usually use it when we're talking about love. Um, but romanticism has a specific, specific meaning in art. Um, and we can see all of the color and the drama and grandiosity happening here. And we can draw parallels between something like this and something like this. There's obviously a lot of drama happening here as well, even some of the same color usage. But style can be old or new. And in fact, a lot of contemporary art draws from historical styles that has very different content and meaning. This is Impressionism. Impressionism was all about capturing light. Expressionism, this is Van Gogh. Expressionism is all about energy of brush strokes. So feeling is communicated by the way the strokes are applied. This is Matisse. This is very abstract figurative work. Kandinsky, sort of quasi landscape work. Duchamp, this is another example of cubism. This is called nude descending a staircase. So we're seeing lots of different angles of the work of the object being depicted at the same time. Seeing a lot of movement here. Here's another example of scale. Um, so this is meant to look like a blow up mylar balloon, but in fact, this is made out of metal. And so that sort of faking of material and the change of scale makes the relationship with this work very strange. Magritte, many of you have probably heard of Magritte. Here's Jackson Pollock and here, the content is very different. It's not necessarily about a thing. And in fact, it's not about a thing. 
It is about a record of the action of creating the work. So there's no subject here per se. There's no, there's no person being depicted. It's just all about the marks used to make the actual work. So it's about the paint and about the energy being depicted. So this is very abstract work. It's an example of abstract expressionism. Hans Hoffmann, another very abstract work. Sandy Warhol, this is pop art. Um, Warhol's whole project was to repeat images over and over again to the point that they lose their intrinsic meaning and become banal. So this Campbell's soup can on its own has a specific meaning, but if we repeat it over and over and over again, it loses that specific meaning and becomes just like wallpaper, just like something that's always around. He did this with people's faces, did it with all sorts of images. This is Roy Lichtenstein, another pop artist, but something very different. Um, he elevated the style of comic books to large paintings, thus making them fine art. So I wanna watch this little video. And I think it's a great introduction to art because it's a, a unconventional artist. So you can also, there's link to this in the PDF of these slides that I'll post um, below the link to this video. So you can always watch this on your own time as well. Probably an ad first. Hey everybody, stop clicking around. I'm in the woods uh, with some water going in the background near my house. In the next 30 You're getting seconds, advertised to in school, right? story is about taking imagination seriously. 14 years ago, I first encountered this ordinary material, fishnet, used the same way for centuries. Today, I'm using it to create permanent billowing voluptuous forms, the scale of hard edge buildings in cities around the world. I was an unlikely person to be doing this. I never studied sculpture, engineering, or architecture. In fact, after college, I applied to seven art schools and was rejected by all seven. I went off on my own to become an artist and I painted for 10 years when I was offered a Fulbright to India. Promising to give exhibitions of paintings, I shipped my paints and arrived in Mahabali Puram. The deadline for the show arrived, my paints didn't. I had to do something. This fishing village was famous for sculpture, so I tried bronze casting. But to make large forms was too heavy and expensive. I went for a walk on the beach, watching the fishermen bundle their nets into mounds on the sand. I'd seen it every day, but this time I saw it differently. A new approach to sculpture, a way to make volumetric form without heavy solid materials. My first satisfying sculpture was made in collaboration with these fishermen. It's a self-portrait titled, Wide Hips. <laughs> we hoisted them on poles to photograph. I discovered their soft surfaces revealed every ripple of wind in constantly changing patterns. I was mesmerized. I continued studying craft traditions and collaborating with artisans, next in Lithuania with lace makers. I liked the fine detail it gave my work, but I wanted to make them larger, to shift from being an object you look at to something you could get lost in. Returning to India to work with those fishermen, we made a net of a million and a half hand-tied knots. Installed briefly in Madrid, thousands of people saw it, and one of them was the urbanist Manuel Sola Morales, who was redesigning the waterfront in Porto, Portugal. 
He asked if I could build this as a permanent piece for the city. I didn't know if I could do that and preserve my art. Durable, engineered, permanent. Those are in opposition to idiosyncratic, delicate, and ephemeral. <laughs> for two years, I searched for a fiber that could survive ultraviolet rays, salt air, pollution, and at the same time remain soft enough to move fluidly in the wind. We needed something to hold the net up out there in the middle of the traffic circle. So we raised this 45,000 pound steel ring. We had to engineer it to move gracefully in an average breeze and survive in hurricane winds. But there was no engineering software to model something porous and moving. I found a brilliant aeronautical engineer who designed sails for America's Cup racing yachts named Peter Heppel. He helped me tackle the twin challenges of precise shape and gentle movement. I couldn't build this the way I knew because hand-tied knots weren't gonna withstand a hurricane. So I developed a relationship with an industrial fishnet factory, learned the variables of their machines, and figured out a way to make lace with them. There was no language to translate this ancient idiosyncratic handcraft into something machine operators could produce. So we had to create one. Three years and two children later, we raised this 50,000 square foot lace net. It was hard to believe that what I had imagined was now built, permanent, and had lost nothing in translation. <laughs> This intersection had been bland and anonymous. Now it had a sense of place. I walked underneath it for the first time. As I watched the wind's choreography unfold, I felt sheltered and at the same time connected to limitless sky. My life was not going to be the same. I want to create these oases of sculpture in spaces of cities around the world. I'm going to share two directions that are new in my work. Historic Philadelphia City Hall, its plaza I felt needed a material for sculpture that was lighter than netting. So we experimented with tiny atomized water particles to create a dry mist that is shaped by the wind. And in testing discovered it can be shaped by people who can interact and move through it without getting wet. I'm using this sculpture material to trace the paths of subway trains above ground in real time, like an x-ray of the city's circulatory system unfolding. Next challenge, the Biennial of the Americas in Denver asked, could I represent the 35 nations of the Western Hemisphere and their interconnectedness in a sculpture? <laughs> I didn't know where to begin, but I said yes. I read about the recent earthquake in Chile and the tsunami that rippled across the entire Pacific Ocean. It shifted the Earth's tectonic plates sped up the planet's rotation, and literally shortened the length of the day. So I contacted NOAA, and I asked if they'd share their data on the tsunami, and translated it into this. Its title, 1.26, refers to the number of microseconds that the Earth's day was shortened. I couldn't build this with a steel ring the way I knew. Its shape was too complex now. So I replaced the metal armature with a soft, fine mesh of a fiber 15 times stronger than steel. The sculpture could now be entirely soft, which made it so light it could tie into existing buildings, literally becoming part of the fabric of the city. There was no software that could extrude these complex net forms and model them with gravity, so we had to create it. Then I got a call from New York City asking if I could adapt these concepts to Times Square or the High Line 
this new soft structural method enables me to model these and build these sculptures at the scale of skyscrapers. They don't have funding yet, but I dream now of bringing these to cities around the world where they're most needed. 14 years ago, I searched for beauty in the traditional things, in craft forms. Now I combine them with high-tech materials and engineering to create voluptuous billowing forms, the scale of buildings. My artistic horizons continue to grow. I'll leave you with this story. I got a call from a friend in Phoenix, an attorney in the office who'd never been interested in art, never visited the local art museum, dragged everyone she could from the building and got them outside to lie down underneath the sculpture. There they were in their business suits, lying in the grass, noticing the changing patterns of wind beside people they didn't know, sharing the rediscovery of wonder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I can turn this off. Okay, so I hope you found that interesting. I think it's really cool how resourceful she is in realizing her dream. And I hope you got an idea of the variety of stuff that we'll look at in the class. So this video was short. I'm going to try to keep all of the lectures at about a half an hour. Um, and they'll all be linked to on Canvas. And, and I think I'll use the modules to set everything up. Um, and I'll write to you guys often by email. So any questions, be sure to email me. It's j.glossop at bellevuecollege.edu. Otherwise, I will see you soon.